Welcome to the Art of Decluttering podcast. We are still in our ADHD and decluttering and organizing series. And today I have a really special guest who comes with a wealth of experience, knowledge, and life experience. Trisha, hello. Hello, Amy. I just thought I've never actually called you Trisha, but I know you call yourself Trisha on all your like website and stuff. Yeah, but if you call me Trisha, I feel like you're my mum and you're going to tell yeah. me off. Yeah, so, so this is my friend Trish. Trish. Yes. <laughs> so Trish is the director and an occupational therapist that planted parenting here in Melbourne. And I have found out in the last week that she's also an adhd which I did not know when I reached out. So that's a pretty cool thing. Trish, tell me a bit about yourself, about your family. Just give us kind of the highlights of you. I am a very zealous and zesty. I just told you that they were my words for myself, but I am. I'm zealous and I'm zesty. I'm an incredibly passionate mother of two. I've got a 12-year-old and a 9-year-old and I love being a mama. I do mama solo. We share parenting with their dad, which is great, and they bounce between me and their other home and that's awesome. And I have my own business planted parenting, which keeps me busy. It's like having 10 newborns, I reckon. It's like playing whack-a-mole all the time. But I love playing whack-a-mole, so it's awesome. It works for our brains, doesn't it? Like as long as there's something that needs our attention, we're kind of happy. Yes, absolutely. And it's like getting that dopamine hit all the time because I'm like Mm. often ordering new resources and they arrive and I'm like, oh, with another package. I love getting a package from Joe at Keiko and I just like, they just come to the letterbox and I'm like, this is so exciting. And then I just order more and then I order more and yeah, it's it's the best. It's a bit addictive to buy more fidgets. And yes, I've got a hotline with Kaiko as well. And so yes, lots of new fidgets are always coming to my door at work. And I'm constantly testing them out with all my clients. Who they <laughs> is. They just love this stuff, which is great. I'm actually going to come back to fidgets in a yes. minute. Cool. Um, but because not everyone will know necessarily what an occupational therapist does and their relationship to people with ADHD, do you want to explain what is an OT? Yeah, an OT helps people to become more independent with all their day-to-day activities. So anything that impacts our day-to-day function is what an OT can help with. And obviously, our ADHD brains can be severely impacted on the day-to-day basis just with those squirrel thoughts, with inattentive sort of things that are going on, with that hyper-focus that can get us lost in activities for ages but also with that complete shutdown of just being non-functional because everything's a bit too overwhelming. Mm. And so I really find that particularly for parents bringing their kids in to see me um, that have ADHD, we're talking a lot about um, how fidget tools can be helpful to regulate while they're working through things with the importance of using lists, the importance of um, how to get ourselves to initiate tasks how to give give ourselves like little targets and rewards with dopamine Mm. hits to kind of encourage us along the way. So it's been really wonderful to share my life experience in this space with lots of little kiddos and their parents and help to give a bit of perspective as well. And also it's kind of cool when your OT runs a business because a lot of people go, oh, I just feel like my child has just they're not able to pin down a thought. How are they going <laughs> to enter the workforce? Like they're really worried and concerned about that aspect of functionality that happens later in life after childhood. And I'm like, that's a real thing to be nervous about as a mm. parent. But for me, I'm like, hey, guess what? My brain works super fast as well. I have lots of thoughts that I'm playing whack-a-mole with. But guess what? You see that car out there? It's got the same sticker on it that's on the front of my door. And I run this place. And just because you have a brain that moves really quickly, it does not mean that you can't work in a workplace. It does not mean that you can't start a business. In fact, research has shown that some of the most exciting and um, innovative entrepreneurs actually have ADHD because they are the ones that are like, oh, that's a great idea. And then five seconds later, they're executing it. And then the business is up and running, which is brilliant for entrepreneurial minds. And yeah, so ADHD brain for the win, I say. 
Yeah, and you um, predominantly see children, don't you? But I would imagine that more and more over the last couple of years, you've then got parents going, and I've also been diagnosed, or I wonder if I too might have ADHD. Do you get to kind of work with the parents to kind of enable them while you're doing that work? Absolutely. I often think that for parents when they come and first and foremost, they're coming to bring their children to get support for their children, but then they're often like, hey, I see a lot of myself in these strategies actually help me and I didn't know that I was just utilising them um, on the day-to-day and that I'm probably a little bit spicy too, a little bit Mm. neurodiverse as well. And so it does cause them to prompt and to think and to reflect and then to either pursue a diagnosis formally or it just says they just might say, hey, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether I have a piece of paper that says it, but I self-identify. And it means that I actually identify really well and connect with my child because we can both be in that boat together. And it's not uncommon that if, you know, a child comes, they're diagnosed it's not uncommon that the rest of the family starts going, oh, I think dad might be a little bit spicy too. Oh, maybe I am as mum or maybe I am as other dad or whatever. Like there is just so much excitement that comes with um, that. And then there's often that sibling that's like, I don't want to be neurotypical. I want to be neurodiverse like everyone else in the family. And they've got FOMO. That's a real thing. It totally is. And we were talking about it at dinner last night, actually, about having that FOMO or feeling like, well, they've got something special that's being celebrated. Like, oh, I'm just boring old me. <laughs> but it, but everybody has amazing brains. It's just that we have different labels and different categories. Yeah. Um, I imagine, Trish, that you would see a lot of parents come in and say things like, they just can't keep their room organized. They're always forgetting things when they go to school, the nighttime routine, like they can't get to sleep. They're really overstimulated. And we get those inquiries too often where they like come into the house and like physically do that decluttering and organizing with us. How does that differ from how you or another OT might work with someone when they've got kind of similar um, obstacles that they're coming up against? Yeah, it's a really tricky space. Um, I often find that when families come to me and there's a lot of overwhelm, I just, with all children, I find neurotypical or neurodiverse visual schedules work really beautifully. So we just break it down to the point that, um, okay, you're going to need to, um, what I would do in that situation, Amy, is I'd actually say, right, Visual schedules work beautifully for children. They work really, really nicely to have lists, to have um, to have checklists that they can move things into a done pile or little picture cards on the wall, depending what age they are, lists for when they're older. And as adults, we actually use lists in our diaries a lot. Mm. And, it's, and we don't realise that that's actually a strategy or a tool to help get going. So I often find um, when I'm working with a family that I say, all right, everything needs to have a place and I'm going to use the, doesn't have to be Smiggle, but the Smiggle pencil case or the Kmart knockoff, whatever works for you in whatever purchasing city that you are or country that you are. But those pencil cases where you unzip and there's literally pages where you can slot in each individual pencil into each one so that when the child is like looking for their red pencil, they flip to the pencil page of their Mm. pencil case and they can see red pencil is right there next to orange pencil. Or when they've used their pencils and there's a couple of pencils on their desk, they can go, oh, I need to to put that away. Where does it go? I'll go and look into the pencil category and push it into the right little slot Mm. for itself. And so having a specific compartment or place for everything is really helpful. And I think that's where decluttering is really important because that visual mess mm-hmm. just is something that you just look at sometimes when you've got ADHD and go, yep, no, nah, not even going to try. And Don't even know that. where to start. Yeah. So it's that whole messy bedroom floor sort of scenario. People with ADHD either know exactly next to what pile is their left shoe and next to what smelly banana is their right shoe Mm -hmm. or they are yeah that's a sea of something crazy and I'm just going to throw a towel over the top because that's (laughs) less scary to look at um and I get that I get that space um but yeah I think it's about having systems and it's Mm. about having a spot for everything and those pencil cases I tell you are the first place to start for kids because if you ask them to look into the black hole of an open unzipped pencil case 
they will never be able to find that red pen, That's even fantastic. if it's right at the top. So have it in a little lip book style mm. pencil case. You You've actually reminded me, you know how in some like older movies in a garage a man might have or a woman might have her tools up mm. on the shelf and they've actually got like that outline around it? Yeah. So you kind of know where to put it. I'm like, yes. how good would that be to have that in like a kitchen drawer? So you're like, oh, oh that's God. exactly where that bit of Tupperware goes or however Maybe. that would work. Oh, I'm so excited by what you've just said. <laughs> Literally, okay, you've seen my pantry. So you have? know that there is a specific I'm a Tupperware girl, but do you do you, whatever works, glass jars, whatever's your thing. But I have a, a, a container for everything. All my baking things are clustered together. All my rices, yes, I have more than one rice because I'm half Asian. I have all my rices together and all of the things, my gluten-free section, mm -hmm. my snackies, my crackers, so many crackers. Um, but they're all labelled and when I see that something's empty, I put it on the list. Like it's yeah. really easy visually for me to categorically see what is where if there are things in front of things that becomes the black hole of death I do not know what is in that basket that has multiple things in it piled on top of each other because it is too frightening to look at yeah. so it's all about having a singular place for everything clear containers labels pictures if they're kids but mm -hmm. like word labels once they're at reading age and have the child do it with you like, yeah. as an adult, do it with the decluttering person um, because then you know exactly where everything is or, you know, make sure that if you are decluttering, Amy, with someone with ADHD, as you would know for yourself too, but asking them where makes sense for you mm -hmm. to be living because you don't want them opening a, a beautifully organised pantry, for example, or wardrobe and going, now, where did Amy put my shoes? Yeah. It makes no sense that they're on the third shelf. For me, I would want them on the bottom shelf because that's near my feet. Um, so always asking the question, I think, is really helpful as a parent if you're trying to help your child organise their stuff. Where is going to be a helpful spot to keep your keys? Mm. Where is going to be a helpful spot to keep your My Key card? You know, those kind of asking those questions because that is also giving them ownership and getting them to use their brain and connect in with their brain and go, yep, I'm going to use that memory strategy to mm. remember where it is. I heard something great the other day. One of my team was saying that when you go to look for something and, you know, you look in five or six different places and you finally find it, when you put it back, don't put it back where you found it, put it back the first place you looked. Interesting. And I was like, that's fantastic because that is in your mind where it belongs because that's the first place you looked. Like and so that. it may be in a random spot. The scissors may not end up in the kitchen drawer. They may be in the wrapping paper box. But if that's where you're going to go look for them, then that makes total sense. I like it. I, I'm going to remember that when mm. I'm talking to family. Thank you. What a great tip. Pleasure. See, always learning. We're always learning people. Always learning. Mm. <laughs> and I think it's really helpful for things like the hat, the school hat or the gum boots, things that you're not using every day it is helpful to kind of go, where would I look for them? Where makes sense? And it might be that you have, so there's like kind of a professional organizing theory that everything is like with like, which I am a massive um, comp proponent. No, what's the word? Compartmentalizer. Mm, no. Massive Thanks. fan of, let's just go with that. <laughs> but practicality has to overrule that. So in my house, I have my shoes in two spots. I have all of my shoes in the wardrobe, but then I have like the three or four pairs of shoes that I'm like wearing almost every day in a box at the front door. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because it doesn't matter that the rule is everything has to be together. Practically, no, that works best for me. Yeah, practically my fidget tools are all over the house because I <laughs> never know where I'm going to need them. So just in case I take a phone call at my reading chair, I've got fidgets there just in case they take a phone call like or I'm doing something in the kitchen and I need to fidget while I'm on the phone. I have fidgets there. I just, yeah. So I talk to me about there. that because a lot of the clients that we work with that are seeing OTs that have different neurodiversities have a lot of fidget things mm -hmm. and sometimes they're small like the things you and I have in our hands right now yep. and sometimes they're really big things. And what we do as professional organisers is like, well, how do you use it? When are you going to access it? Who needs to have access to it? And then we create systems. And there's things that as an ADHD you have in your house that a neurotypical person probably doesn't have, like weighted blankets or swings or a lot of fidget toys or 
you know, processes that you need to follow for brushing your teeth at night. Yeah. When you're working with clients, how do you kind of help them to identify what those categories are and set them up in the house? Is it just, as you said, wherever you're going to use it or is it a central place? Really great question, Amy. It does depend on the family. So this is where I would check in with the family and say, all right, where is the go-to central point of the house? Because that is where I will put the visual schedule for the morning routine. Mm. If the central point of the house is the dining room kitchen space, have it on the wall there. Yeah. Um, and I always say blue tag, nothing's permanent. So you blue tag, you can move it around. And also familiarity gets people that have ADHD like nothing else. So if you have, you would know this, if you have a photo on your wall, people can relate. You look at that photo when you first put it up, but then after three weeks, you know that photo's there, but you don't look at it anymore. You just know that it's there. It's just like you know what your kids look like so you don't stare at them deeply like you do a new partner or something like that. Mm. It's not. It's that familiarity that familiarity. just allows us to just kind of, you know, we know so we don't have to look deeply. So moving visual schedules around on blue tack is really helpful. So you might have it on the same wall but in a strip going horizontally instead of vertically. Mm. Um, or you might have them in a zigzag pattern just to create a bit of visual interest because that's really important for people with ADHD to have something that's visually like, oh, that's different. That will help that's that great. little squirrel moment to just grab that attention and like, oh, what's oh, the visual schedule? Oh, it's in a zigzag today. Oh, that's a bit random. Why did mum do that? Oh, I might go have a look at it. Oh, it says brush my teeth. Go and do that. All right, off we go. So I often tell parents like mix it, mix it up how it looks put it in a circle one day and yeah. the beauty of blue pack is if you've got lots of different individual steps or tasks and you've broken it up onto little cards and laminated them or not laminated them just write them on a bit of paper do what you do you use post-its whatever works and then just lay them out in a different pattern or stick a piece of colored paper behind it that's a different color to the day before just create visual interest mm. that would be my first tip my second tip is like you said with your shoes the regulars you have out on high excess uh -huh. and then your semi non-regulars or whatever in a more like still a convenient spot but you'd have to go and work for it but you know it's a central location for me it's important that I have pens in every room of the house because I like to doodle ideas as I go uh -huh. and if I don't have my phone I want to write it down so I've got a post-it pad and pens in most spots in the house so I can jot stuff down that works for me I don't have it I like clean surfaces most of the time uh -huh. so I would just have it tucked you know onto the top of the top drawer or you know tucked behind a photo frame so it's not visually in my face yeah. but I know that it's there so that I would do the same with my fidget tools as well that's so that's great. something that I would do um and lists I mean like really at the end of the day sometimes that executive functioning bites us in the bottom doesn't it and uh -huh. it's really hard to get started when you get into a nice hot shower and work out what what you've got to start with I think this is more for the kids than the adults I think we should hopefully know how to wash ourselves but the kids it's like oh this water is so nice it's waking my body up this is great 10 minutes later have you washed yourself oh no maybe not but having a list on the outside of the shower um, mm. screen blue tacked on there again love the blue tack um you can just wipe away the uh, steam read what's next or see the picture of what's next watch body part to do next or you might have a picture of a gingerbread man numbered like Face is one, yeah. arms are two, blah, 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 et cetera, down to all your private parts is last um, and so on. So you could have something like that. So mm. visual in the shower just to break the cycle and, again, move it around from screen to screen just so that it's, oh, oh look, there's a gingerbread there man. It is. It's on a different, oh, it's up high today, it's down low today. Um, create that little bit of visual interest. So list some things where it's relevant but move the location have some bright color behind it or lay it out in a slightly different configuration mm. keep that visual spark happening I, I love this like my brain's like going in a million different directions of things I want to like oh I want to go deeper in that oh no, no. one of the things I find that our kids with ADHD like our clients that we work with they love having like their bedroom rearranged mm. and there's this like fresh energy and the parents will say oh my goodness they actually tidied up cleaned up kept their room organized because even though it was harder work to get the bedroom in this new format and set things up and there's still more interest and so the kids are more highly engaged and if we just went all right let's just tidy up if we went where would you like the bed they're Ooh. like okay I'm in 
we get to change it. We get to move big body muscles. Like it's. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. And for the active kids to get them involved with helping to push furniture, obviously, you know, under adult supervision. Safely, yep. Safely, <laughs> safety first. But getting them to help with that heavy work, that stop, start, sort of big body movement things is really calming to the sensory system. Mm. So getting them involved, I remember as a kid, like, and this is me reflecting on my childhood now going, I used to move my room around every couple of months and I oh, yeah. loved it and it was spick and span for the next few months. And then I'd be like, hmm. And then it got to a point where I would like measure everything and do a to scale configuration <laughs> of all my furniture. And then I'd move it around first on the paper and then go, yes, this is going to look great. And then I'd go tick, 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 do the Tetris music in my head as I was doing it and maybe get my parents to help me. Now that I'm an adult, I don't get anyone to help me because I'm Dutch and I'm stubborn as well. So <laughs> I just do it all myself. And I'm like, oh, that looks awesome. I'm so tired. Why am I so tired? And then I sleep. For but you're hyper-focused. So it's yeah, all good. You yeah, can do anything yeah, when you're yeah, hyper-focused. Yeah. But that whole idea of getting kids to help really good and calming on the sensory system mm. is motivating and they've got 100% buy-in. If yeah. you say, hey, do you want to go and choose a different Duna cover or do you want to go choose what your shelves for your shoes are going to look like at Ikea? Mm. They're going to be like, oh, it's a bit exciting rather than, oh, look what magically appeared in my wardrobe that I don't know how to use. That's right. And I just want it to be what it was because now it's just too overstimulating. Yeah, exactly. So labels are really important for where things are. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, draw organizers, I would say, would have to be my absolute all time fave to talk to about families. Because when you open a drawer, like the junk drawer in a desk is often just like pens and paper, scrunched up stuff, erasers, stuff that's like fluff bunnies, who knows, who knows what's in there. Um, apple cores that are really shriveled, you know, kids' bedrooms are just interesting at best. They sure are. But when you open those drawers, if you've got some drawer organisers in there, like that's my little thing for paper clips and whatnots, and then that's my little thing for pens, and that's my section of where my erasers kept, it just visually is a lot more calming to look at. Mm. Um, and then it makes it easier to scan. And so I'm often teaching kids who are scanning top to bottom, left to yeah. right, just scanning across like we're reading. So we scan left to right, and then we go down a row, left to right, and or that sort of snaking left yep. to right across ways or up and down so that you make sure you cover the whole drawer when you're scanning or you're covering mm. the whole wardrobe. So I often work a lot on that scanning strategy. Yep. Um, but then making sure that there's a little spot for everything just means that that drawer doesn't become this chaotic. Oh, the drawers of doom are so overwhelming. Absolutely. And so, yeah, lots of things labelled, lots of things categorised. And if the kids are part of that and when you notice your kids, if you pull open their drawer and it's just busting and there's like it's all a mess, you can actually ask them if it would help them if you sat together and do it. Because mm. if, if you asked me as a kid, Trish, can you just go and clean out your whole wardrobe, refold everything and put it back in where it's supposed to go? I'd be like, yeah, nah, thanks for the offer. Um but then if if you actually say, hey, how about I sit with you and do it as a parent, like it's a great connection time for your attachment, but it's also really helpful for an ADHD brain to have companionship. I'm the first to volunteer to go and clean my friend's house today. Uh. I'm the first to volunteer and say, hey, I'll cook you meals and I will clean your house for you. And is my house clean? Probably not as clean as it could be. Is um, Do I cook myself dinner? We were talking about this before. Yeah, maybe there's something reheated in the microwave from two days ago. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, that body doubling is an incredible thing. And I talked um, with Carly quite a lot about that in her episode, which will have come out maybe last week or the week before because we're recording ahead of time. But I think it is, you know, one of the things we do with our kids is we found that when drawers had multiple functions, and this is what I found for myself too, drawers that had multiple functions just kind of became a red hot mess Mm. and really overwhelming. And so I used to fold everything and everything was like the shorts next to the pants, next to the t-shirts, next to the jumpers, and it was all perfect, but it didn't work for us. And so what we ended up going with is this is just the school uniforms and Mm. nothing is folded. As long as they're in there, we're cool. And look, we go to a school that doesn't have a uniform for the everyday, like we've got sports uniforms and volleyball uniforms, but not like a everyday school uniform 
but it means they can be thrown in there and it means that the basketball uniforms are just in one cupboard of their own rather than separating out, well, the basketball shorts go with the shorts, Mm. the basketball tops go with the tops. When you're in ADHD, you just need to be able to reach in, grab your thing and go. Like you don't want to have to search. You don't want to have to go through it and find things like that. It's, It's too hard. And, and I think that comes back to what you were saying before, Amy, about category grouping. Mm. So these are things that are in a similar category, so I store them in a similar place. And that's yeah. the same with clothes. Like I'm the same with the way I organise my children's um, uniforms. Mm. The uniform drawer is a drawer in itself. Um, yes, I like it to be folder-esque, but, uh, you know, they're not at a private school where we have to have everything pressed. Yeah. Um, polo sh- shirts are very forgiving and so are sports shorts. They're very yep. forgiving when you scrunch them into a drawer or leggings are. But, um, yeah, I find that if you categorically put things together, it works better. And then your everyday T-shirts are all linked together mm-hmm. and your everyday jumpers are all linked together. Drawers are great for that and so are housekeepers, Amy. Let's just say sometimes you just need someone to just come in and just pick up the pieces every couple of weeks and just refold everything for you. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I sometimes find that children can be like chooks and they just kind of search through and scuffle through everything. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, all that beautifully, beautifully folded stuff that you laboured over as a parent is just undone. And And that's why I gave up folding. (laughs) (laughs) This is why I can't look at it. So I just, once I've given the folded things to my Mm -hmm. children, my son likes to use the T-shirt folder himself. Oh, yeah. Foldy, foldy situation the traps anything yeah it's great and this nine dollars a cent at Aldi I tell you what but he loves to use that but as soon as I've passed over the clean things that I folded initially or passed over to be folded it is out of my hands then yeah. I'm like that is not my responsibility anymore and my kids are older now so they yep. they know that they're on onto it themselves um but yeah my wardrobe also is a bit of a situation and I'm all I'm constantly Oh, I think I'll just pull out and reorganise. I think I want it in colour, colour gradient order today. Mm, yeah, that's a good idea, but categorically and then colour gradient. So it's oh, cool. yeah, it has to be category, then colour gradient. And in, yeah. in my wardrobe, it's long dresses, jackets, cardigans, then it's pants, skirts, singlet tops, work shirts, other tops. Like it has to be in the same order. Yeah, that's Whereas okay. my husband's wardrobe is just like he just puts everything in. Yeah, okay, well, you do you. Everyone's yeah. different. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm like you, Amy, very A-type systems, categories, yeah. books are in high order, maybe not alphabetical. I know that doesn't make sense, but aesthetically that's... It's what it works for you and that's that's the beauty of this, isn't it? Yeah. It's like about, an OT it's about is, <laughs> Yeah, and OT is not about saying here's the rules, you must follow them. Oh. It's about going how do you work? Like you must ask a lot of questions Ooh. so that you really understand people. I want to ask about... Um, how as a occupational therapist in a session with a kid and you've got them kind of going off in distraction land we find it all the time with our clients we sometimes say we have to chase our ADHD clients around the house (laughs) because they'll pick something up and then they'll go oh I'll take this for here and you chase after them you're like come back we're still doing this task (laughs) and I can only imagine that would be even more so with kids yeah what are some tips for our listeners if they're the ADHD that is constantly kind of going off and, and wandering around off task or if they're working with their kids who are like that? Yeah, I find timers help a lot. Mm. So um, I might either use a song as the timer, um, a song that they like obviously will help and say, all right, we're going to do this for until the song finishes because that gives an end point. I mm. think for an ADHD brain to have an open-ended task and like we're going to do it till it's finished, that can feel very monumental. So you need segments, little segments to bite size off and then say, after we've done this song, you can go do free time for X amount of time and then I'm going to call you back in and we're going to do another round. What's your next song? And have that cue yeah. ready to go. So I find that works really beautifully. Some people like timers as in just, you know, timer on your phone mm-hmm. or whatever um, or an egg timer if they're a visual person. Um, do what works for you in terms of a timer. But timers are a godsend when it comes to ADHDers. Also, breaking the task up into little chunks and writing it on post-its so you can just do, all right, we've done that bit, let's remove it so you can see the list getting shorter. There is yeah, nothing, that's great. Nothing worse for an adhd than seeing this task and going, 
oh my gosh, we're still going. Oh my gosh, there's more. And they don't see that anything has been We don't see progress very well. Yeah. And I'll use this as an example. I am the kind of person that writes a to-do list, Amy, but I'm also the kind of person that writes all the jobs that I've already done that day on the to-do list so I can feel accomplished, right? Yep. And it's that dopamine hit of, oh, I've ticked something off, I've crossed it off, yes. And so making sure that you're allowing your ADHD to chase their dopamine mm. by crossing things off, feeling accomplished um, is really, really important. So, mm. yes, yeah, that is something that I would say 100% is an absolute exquisite thing to do for your ADHD brains or your child's ADHD brain. When I was growing up, I was always taught that you do the work and then you enjoy the reward which I think theoretically in a lot of areas is great. It's certainly a principle I use in finances as I'll work and then buy something rather than put something on credit. Yeah. However, as an adhd I don't want to do the groceries and then reward myself by buying a chocolate bar. I want to get the chocolate bar, get the dopamine of like, oh, I've got my favourite chocolate bar, I've got a bit of energy, and then do the task. Mm. Can you kind of, is that something that you can relate to? <laughs> When you're like, I don't want to work for the reward when it comes to organising, I want the reward. So I might want the new pencil case before I organise, not let's organise and then we'll let you buy the pencil case. Yeah, look, I hear you in that space because for people with ADHD, executive functioning is a real challenge or even just people with executive functioning disorder or challenges with their executive functioning. So you've got to provide a carrot or, a, you know, like the carrot and the donkey situation, you've yeah. got to dangle a carrot that is motivating to actually start because initiation is often the big so issue. So hard. Like you may know that you know that you know that you have an assignment due at 5 p.m., but you're not going to be starting that assignment till 1 p.m. because you've got to be like really be feeling the pressure to complete it. And then you're just sitting there and you're firing away and you, you pump out your best work, obviously. Yes, yeah, right. unfortunately it rewards itself. It does, unfortunately. But, you know, for me, it's not healthy for me to be writing reports at 3 in the morning because I started them at 11 p.m. at night because I've yeah. rewarded myself for even starting before that by watching some things on Netflix. Yeah. So what I would say is if a sweet treat is your thing, there is – the twin pack of the Mars bar or the twin pack Ooh. of the cherry ripe. So you can have half to start as your reward for even kickstarting, but then you get the other half as your reward at the end. Oh, that is like mic drop. That is brilliant. <laughs> I don't know why I've ever thought of that before. Well, come to the OT for the goods. I tell you oh, that. That is brilliant. Yes. So similarly, if there are two things on your wish list that are sitting in your cart when you go to purchase something, you might allow yourself to add the first thing to the cart before you start and then the reward is you add the last thing and you click purchase at the very end of the task. So mm. for me, for example, if I'm on a clothing website and there is a big sale, I will add things to my cart incrementally as I've completed another page of a reward of, of a report <sighs> so that I've got incremental rewards, in, incremental dopamine hit of, oh, yeah. that's going to come, oh, that's going to come. So either that or I've got my little chain of lollies down the side of my desk and I get one lolly for every page. I'm a sweet tooth. That works for me. Food bribe right, so you food. literally lay them lay them out. Yeah, it's a visual. It's a visual. It's that's a one-for-one one correspondence. So. I do one, one enter data into one matrix, I get one lolly. I enter data, data into the next matrix, I get another lolly. Oh, and then stunning. I've got my, and I've got my 12 lined up because I know there's 12 things that I have to do. Yeah. And then my incremental rewards. Your incremental rewards could be a five minute scroll break. It could be a five minute um, dance party. It could be allowing yourself to send a text message to that person that you really wanted to text about X, Y, Z. Mm. It could be looking up the cricket scores. It could, whatever it is, it could, you've just got to find what your dopamine hit is going to be and incrementally put them down in a row to, ch- to sort of help you chase and motivate yourself. That's, that's really good. Oh, well, I'm glad that was really helpful. good. Even if it's only helpful for you, Amy, the rest of the listeners <laughs> hopefully found some gold in there as well. A 
a lot of us as professional organizers, and I don't know if this is just an art of decluttering thing or whether other people in our industry do, but we often will have like a little box of lollies in our kit. And so when there's like, you can see someone's just getting tired or losing a bit of motivation, we're like, okay, for every additional jacket that you get rid of, you can have a lolly. And yeah. I'd not really thought of it in terms of that, what you've been describing as like, here's what you're, it's, I thought it was more like a sugar hit, but actually it's that motivation and the incentive and something to look forward to and it makes it tangible. Yep. So for me in a session, I will have, I have a plethora of fidgets, like it's a ridiculous amount. I pretty much own all of Kaiko fidgets and I own what's not even on the website yet. Like I own it all. <laughs> I'm a junkie and I'm here to admit it. But it's for work purposes and for self purposes. So everyone wins. But I would actually get out, say, 10 of my newest ones and say, we're going to do this. And then you can, you can have an explore of any one of these. Uh-huh. And then, and then they've explored that. I'm like, great. Now we're going to do our next little bit. And then you can explore any one of the ones that are left. And we keep going until we're all done with our task. We've done it in little incremental chunks. They get a dopamine hit from something Uh that they haven't explored before or that's new and different, similar to movement breaks. I had a little one in here in the rooms today and they really struggle with handwriting at school. School is boring. Handwriting is boring. The teacher thinks they can't write. This little one, I said, okay, go and move your body. Jump and throw yourself into the crash mat as many times as you can. I bet you can't do 10. He was like, well, I can do 10. And I was like, all right, well, show me your 10. <laughs> he did 10, came back to the table nice and regulated. We wrote one sentence. That was it, one sentence. That was uh-huh. hard yakka for the kid. They wrote the one sentence. I was like, you're brilliant. This is amazing. I wonder what you're going to use next. I'm going for the swing next. And he went on to the swing and I was like, all right, you got two minutes on the swing. We pushed hard. He swung. There was twisting. It was fun. Came back and did another sentence. Mm. Happily wrote that sentence because his body was regulated. He'd had a movement break. That was a dopamine hit for him as well. And we got through three sentences, never written that much in class. Amazing. Mum was just like, what the heck? And I was like, They've got the skills. You just got to find the right carrot to dangle to get them through. Yeah. And you need to break up the task. A full worksheet looks scary. So cover the top and the bottom and only show the question that they need to do mm. one at a time. So hiding hiding the, the rest of the mess and just saying, this is just do this drawer. Just, yeah. just look at this drawer. That's all we're doing. And then you put that drawer away. Go have a five-minute break. Go do five minutes of scrolling. Go do five minutes of YouTube chasing or Super Mario Kart on the Nintendo Switch, whatever you want. Then come back and we'll do the next draw. That's if you great. show them the whole chest of drawers, they're going to flip their lid 100% and go, no buy-in, no thanks. It's too much. A lot of our ADHDers will qualify when they speak to me and say, please tell me you don't do what they do on TV and pull every item of my clothes out and tip it on my bed. Oh. And I'm like, I promise if you don't want to sit, like some people say to us, do that because I need the fresh. But most people find that really overwhelming. So we would say, actually, we're just going to do formal dresses. And then Ooh. when that's done, we're going to do your casual dresses. And when that's done, we're going to do your work dresses. Like how nano can we break it down so that you feel like like, oh, I've done that tick, you know, as you yeah. said, like crossed it off the list. Oh, mm-hmm. I've done the next thing. This isn't so hard. Maybe I can do all of my jeans at the same time and not my fancy jeans just versus my hangout jeans. Oh my gosh. I also have fancy jeans and hangout jeans. <laughs> and then I've got the floppy jeans that have got rips in them that I'm mad for that are for camping. So that's the best. I mean, who would have thought there's so many categories for jeans, Amy? Oh, look, I, it surprises me as a professional organiser. Every time you think you've developed a category, you can like go deeper and go, oh, we could we could further separate this to reduce that overwhelm. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. This is why I think decluttering and not necessarily living as a minimalist, but actually uh-huh. knowing that there's a specific place for everything in your home and actually being able to see everything when you open a cupboard, it's not just a mound of things yep. that have just piled up. And I think periodically, um, if you do get overwhelmed and have anxiety as well, it's really important to have someone, a support person or someone to come in and actually like actually employ them to help you declutter, yep. to actually help you with that process and do it with you. 
I actually found that inviting a friend over with a glass of wine or a cocktail and then actually going through to help me cull my wardrobe if, you know, from those clothes that you haven't worn in 18 months or more. Yeah. And that's so much more fun because you could be holding stuff up. There's a bit of a joke in there. You can be talking about memories with different clothing items. But you're having fun while you're doing it. Often if you're just doing it on your own, it's a bit mediocre and pedestrian, to be honest. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't give you that dopamine hit. That's correct. And for me, my dopamine hit comes from other people. So I often will take someone along for the journey with me if it's a bit of a boring task that I know I'm going to struggle to start Mm -hmm. or struggle to stay motivated during. So, yes, that is a big thing. And also that old adage of if you dump everything on your bed, you'll fold your washing it before you go to sleep. That's not true. That's not. You fall under the mound. Correct. Or you push it on the floor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Totally. Like that doesn't. That well, may, it may work for some people. It doesn't that. generally across the board work. So one of the so you've kind of covered the if you're seeing an OT and you you want to have additional help at home, a professional organizer is great. But I also want you to kind of help our community identify. Oh, when is it time to reach out to an OT? Like when do I go? Occupational therapy is something that's worth pursuing. Obviously, people don't just have to have disabilities or be supported through the NDIS to see an OT. So what would you say kind of is the, here's the time to think about it? Oh, my goodness, Amy. I was literally talking to a colleague about this at a course that I was at a couple of weeks ago. And we were were both OTs, but she was like, I need to see an OT. And I was like, Mm. me too, because OTs help with anything that you do in a 24-hour period because that is an occupation. An occupation is something that occupies us. And so if you've got an area where you're finding that you're struggling with that occupation, whether it's sleep, whether it's um, exercise, whether it's keeping an area clean, whether it's an actual physical skill that you're not able to do and you haven't mastered and you've YouTubed it to the cows come home and you still can't do it, See an OT because OTs are really good at observing how you do something, really thinking about you in the context of the environment Mm. that you're in and what you're trying to tackle. They look at your body mechanics. They look at your thought process. So they look at the cognitive, the physical and the environment. They look at what importance that has amongst your roles and who you are and your values. And then they go, okay, how could you do that differently? And they work with you to problem solve. So OT is really individual. It's mm. really specific. It shouldn't be a cookie cutter model. And if it is, I don't think that's OT. OT find a different really OT. Be, yeah, maybe find a different one. Yeah. You, you want someone that's actually going to go, what's important to you? What is your goal? Okay, show me how you're doing it. Okay, mm. I can see how you're doing it. How about we try doing it like this? Give it a try. Let's see how it feels for you. And it could feel a bit weird and a bit strange and a bit different because it's an un, it's the first time you've done it that way. Yeah. But often people go, I never thought of doing it that way. Well, that, that just seems like common sense. And I'm like, well, if it was common sense, you wouldn't need us. But <laughs> thanks for telling me that it was a really easy idea to implement. Because that's, that's right. I think the best ideas are things that people go, oh, my gosh, that's so simple. That It should feel like that when you see an OT. It should feel like a really simple thing to implement, but it mm. makes a transformational change in your life. That's brilliant. And and like I, I just see that reflected so much when we're working with clients that are like, oh, I can't believe I didn't think of this or, oh, my goodness, that one thing you did meant that I've been on time for work for the last two weeks. You're like, oh, this is, this is why we do what we do. That's right. And it, there is nothing more fulfilling, I think, as an individual supporting someone that has reached out for help. And you'll find this too, Amy, that when they go, oh my goodness, my life feels so much richer because of what you spoke into my life or what you directed me to try or the system that you put in place that I never thought would be like goal, like Mm life-changing. I just, I find that such a special place to be in and such a privileged space um, as an OT and I'm sure you feel like that as a declutterer, decluttering queen, um, that, you know, you go into a space where people are vulnerable, they've Mm -hmm. opened themselves up to you and gone, I've clearly got some issues in hoarding or in stockpiling or in piling everything into a cupboard and then shutting it before visitors come over. Hello, that's me. Um, And then, you know, you're actually able to help them unpack that, find a system that works for them, 
So I find the exact same thing as an OT. Families come to me, they go, look, we're really struggling with this. And to begin with, for an ADHD kid, I would actually get masking tape out and just tape a little pathway from the door to the bed. And then it's a really narrow pathway. And I'm like, all you have to do is keep that pathway clear. That Mm. tiny little pathway that's just wide enough for two feet to shuffle up. And then slowly you widen that pathway bit by bit so that there's less of a mound on the floor and there's Uh actually a pathway that's marked and it's just masking tape. It will come off. It's low tack if you're a bit fussy about your flooring or your carpet. Masking tape or washi tape is really great for that because it leaves minimal residue, if any, but it it is enough adhesion to sort of give a visual visual line or a visual Mm. boundary. For, for kids to work towards and kids work beautifully with boundaries if you're very clear that. about boundaries and expectations if they know the perimeter of a school because there's a fence around it or a perimeter around a playground they know they can operate safely within that space so mm. if you just say this little channel here from the door to your bed is the channel of empty this is the clear pathway that's all it this this just has to stay clear kids will go oh that's achievable Yes, the yeah. piles on either side might be as big as the Red Sea parting, but, you know, at least there's a little avenue for them to make their way safely from A to B without tripping over, yeah. causing another bruise on the shins. And you're like, where did that come from, Johnny? And Johnny's like, I don't know. But, you know, perfectly well, they stacked it going to bed <laughs> or trying to go to the toilet at night. Yeah. So clear pathways is where I would start with a kid's bedroom personally. Yeah. Um, and then slowly work towards the systems and putting things mm. away, finding a home for everything. I love it. This has been just a really lovely way. I think we might have one more episode in the ADHD series or maybe two, but I feel like it's almost culminating and growing as each person adds in their experience and adds in their expertise. So thank you so much. I'm going to put all the links to your business in the show notes so people can find you and you know, join the OT world with their kids or with themselves. Thank I you have, so much. Oh, you're so welcome. I have so many families that inbox me on um, Instagram and Facebook that just want to drop a sim- single question in and, hey, what do you think about this? Or, oh, I love does my car, Does my kid need OT? Do I need OT? And I'm always happy to answer those questions because I think, you know, if I can point people in the right direction for the support they need, be that to people like yourselves or be that to other OTs or myself, depending where they are in the world, mm. I'm all for it. If people can have a more positive outlook on their own lives, I'm mad for it. I'm like high-fiving about <laughs> that. Yep, for sure. She's mad for it, people. Yep, mad for it. Not in a crazy way. And they're like totally <laughs> joyous and delicious. We're behind you, way. way. Yes, yes. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, listeners. Make sure you check out the show notes. If you haven't listened to the other episodes in the ADHD series, get on it. Get those playing in your ears. Um, And I will see you next week. Bye. I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of the land this podcast is recorded on. I would also like to pay respects to their elders, both past and present of the Kulin Nation, and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you enjoyed today's episode, I would love you to rate and review the show on your podcast app. That will help others to find the Art of Decluttering podcast as well. If you'd like any more information, you can visit theartofdecluttering.com.au and I would love to see you in my Facebook group. Just search the Art of Decluttering community on Facebook and join today. I hope that you have an incredible rest of your day and enjoy the freedom.